Hi everyone, welcome to IGCSE Study Buddy, where you can revise biology topics from the Cambridge IGCSE syllabus. If you are enjoying these videos so far, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. In this video, you are going to learn part 1 of chapter 16, Reproduction. Reproduction is the process of making more of the same kind of organism. There are two types of reproduction that you need to be aware of. Asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Let's first learn about asexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is a process resulting in the production of genetically identical offspring from one parent. You should be able to identify if the type of reproduction is asexual or not based on the information provided. So remember that this type of reproduction occurs with just one parent, there is no mixing of genetic information. So offspring are genetically identical to the parent and each other, essentially making them clones. Examples of asexual reproduction include binary fission. This is when a bacterial cell produces exact genetic copies of itself and new potato plants developing from the buds or eyes of a potato tuber. The resulting plant is genetically identical to the parent plant. Let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of asexual reproduction to a population of a species in the wild and to crop production. Advantages are faster reproduction. Asexual reproduction doesn't require a mate, so organisms can reproduce more quickly, leading to larger populations and in the case of crops, leading to increased production and yield. Consistent offspring. It produces genetically identical offspring, which can be advantageous in a stable environment because the offspring are well suited to the environment in which they were born. This also ensures that crops will have the same desirable traits and characteristics. Energy efficient. Asexual reproduction requires less energy since only one parent is needed. So organisms do not need to waste energy searching for mates or producing gametes. So this is advantageous for organisms that live in habitats where finding a mate is difficult. In the case of crops, there is no need for pollination. Asexual reproduction eliminates the need for pollination which can be beneficial in environments where pollinators are scarce. The disadvantages are there is no genetic diversity in the population because asexual reproduction produces genetically identical offspring. This can be problematic in a changing environment because the population may not be able to adapt to new conditions. This also makes them vulnerable to disease because asexual reproduction produces genetically identical offspring, a disease or a parasite that affects one individual can quickly spread to the entire population, causing significant damage. Moving on to sexual reproduction, sexual reproduction is a process involving the fusion of the nuclei of two gametes or sex cells to form a zygote that is the fertilized egg cell and the production of offspring that are genetically different from each other. Fertilization is the fusion of the nuclei of gametes. So gametes are sex cells. In animals, the sex cells are sperm and ovum as shown in the picture. And in plants, the sex cells are pollen nucleus and ovum. The nuclei of gametes are haploid and the nucleus of a zygote is diploid. 
what does this mean in human beings a normal body cell contains 46 chromosomes but each gamete contains 23 chromosomes that is half the number of chromosomes found in other body cells so gametes have a haploid nucleus this is because they only contain one copy of each chromosome instead of the two copies found in other body cells. When the male and female gametes fuse, they form a diploid zygote with the full 46 chromosomes. So the nuclei of gametes are haploid, while the nucleus of a zygote is diploid, containing the same number of chromosomes as a normal body cell. So as you may notice in this picture, the number of chromosomes are double in the zygote when compared to the number of chromosomes in the gametes. An easy way to remember this is haploid starts with H and so does half, diploid starts with D and so does double. What are the advantages and disadvantages of sexual reproduction to a population of species in the wild and to crop production? Advantages of sexual reproduction are increased genetic diversity. There is variation among offspring and therefore they are more adaptable to a changing environment. They are also less vulnerable to disease. That is, they are more likely to withstand the disease. Disadvantages of sexual reproduction are it requires the fusion of two gametes so requires the time and energy to find a mate. It is also a slower process reducing the speed of reproduction and potentially leading to lower production yields. Moving on to sexual reproduction in plants in plants, flowers contain the reproductive organs, which typically contain both male and female reproductive parts. Male gametes or sex cells are found within pollen grains. Since it can't move on its own to reach the female reproductive organs, it uses the help of insects or wind through a process called pollination. You are required to be able to identify in diagrams and images and even draw the parts of an insect pollinated flower. This is a sepal. This is a petal. This is an anther. This is a filament. Collectively, the anther and filament is called the stamen and make up the male reproductive part of the flower. It may be easy to remember this part since it has the word men in it. This is the stigma. This is the style. This is the ovary. And these are ovules. Collectively, the style, stigma and ovary is called carpal and make up the female reproductive part of the flower. Let's learn the functions of the structures of the flower now. The sepal protects the unopened flower. Petals are brightly colored in insect pollinated flowers to attract insects. The anther contains pollen, that is the male sex cells. The filament supports the anther. The stigma is the sticky surface that catches pollen. The style links stigma to the ovary. The ovary produces ovum, that is the female sex cell. The ovule is found inside the ovary and contains the female sex cells. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from an anther to a stigma. 
This transfer process may occur with the help of insects or wind. To adapt to their specific pollination method, insect and wind pollinated flowers possess different structures. These are the structural adaptations of an insect pollinated flower. Petals in insect pollinated flowers are large and bright to attract insects. The amount of pollen present is moderate since insects are more efficient in pollination. Pollen grains are large, heavy, sticky and spiky so it's more likely to stick to the insect's body. Scent and nectar are present to attract insects. The stigma is sticky so that pollen can get stuck onto it when an insect brushes past and the stigma is inside the flower. The anther is inside the flower and is firmly attached to brush against insects. Let's look at the structural adaptations of a wind pollinated flower. Petals in wind pollinated flowers are small and dull. Pollen is present in large amounts to increase the chance of successful pollination. Pollen grains are smooth, small and light so that they are easily blown by the wind. Scent and nectar are absent in wind pollinated flowers. The stigma is feathery to catch drifting pollen grains and it's outside the flower. The anther is outside the flower swinging loosely to release pollen grains easily. Self-pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of the same flower or a different flower on the same plant. Cross-pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower on a different plant of the same species. Let's discuss the potential effects of self-pollination and cross-pollination on a population. Self-pollination results in a reduction of genetic variation. This can be a disadvantage if environmental conditions change because reduced genetic variation may limit the ability of offspring to adapt to changing environmental conditions. Cross-pollination, on the other hand, increases genetic variation but is reliant on the presence of pollinators, which can be a problem if they are missing. This is a concern as the loss of pollinators like bees can have a significant impact on food crops. But wind-pollinated plants are not affected. Fertilization occurs when a pollen nucleus fuses with a nucleus in an ovule. Here's how fertilization takes place. The pollen grain lands on the stigma. A pollen tube begins to grow down the style until it enters the ovule through the micropyle. The pollen nucleus from the pollen grain moves down the pollen tube. The pollen nucleus fuses with the ovum nucleus. This is fertilization and a zygote has been formed. The zygote will start to divide and eventually form a seed within the ovule. The ovary wall eventually develops into a fruit. Finally, let's learn about germination. The beginning of seed growth is referred to as germination. For successful germination, three factors are essential. 
Water causes the seed to expand and activates the enzymes within the embryo to initiate growth. Oxygen is needed for respiration to release energy for growth. A suitable temperature is needed. This increases the rate of germination as enzyme-catalyzed reactions are temperature-dependent up to an optimum. Let's investigate germination. Set up four boiling tubes, each containing 10 crest seeds on cotton wool. Set each test tube as shown in the diagram. Leave tubes in a set environment for a period of time. So all four test tubes will have the same number of seeds. In all test tubes except for test tube D, the temperature will be maintained at 20 degrees Celsius. In test tube A, water is the factor being tested, so the cotton wool will be dry. Test tube B is the control, so all factors necessary for germination are present. That is water or moisture, oxygen and a suitable temperature. In test tube C, oxygen is the factor being tested. So it will be blocked out with oil. And test tube D is placed in a fridge at 4 degrees Celsius. So these seeds do not have an environment with warm temperature. Compare the results and see which tube has the greatest number of germinated seeds. These are the results of the experiment. In test tube A, there was no moisture, so the seeds did not germinate. In test tube B, the seeds germinated since they had all factors necessary for germination. This is the control. In test tube C, the seeds did not get oxygen, so they did not germinate. In test tube D, the seeds did not get warmth, so they did not germinate. That concludes part 1 of chapter 16, Reproduction. Hope this video helped you. Please share your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to IGCSE Study Buddy for more biology revision videos. Bye!